Welcome everyone to the Patrick Dice Global Health Innovators talk series. Here we talk about different computers, computational solutions, uh, which are healthcare relevant and crowdsource based. Uh, to know more about us, visit us at patrick.org and dice.patrick.org. And to join our volunteer team, please visit tiny.cc slash patrick slack. And to visit the previous talks, please attend tiny.cc slash pcf research talks. Uh, once again, thanks a lot to all my co-organizers uh, in putting together this talk, Ramesh Raskar, Nisi Hudson, Graham, uh, Dodge, and uh, Nina Resik. Uh, without these, it would have been very difficult to put this amazing set of series together. And a quick intro about the talk series. We arrange research meetups between speakers who are creating an impact in digital health through AI, software, and technology. The primary motivation for this talk series is to drive collaboration in AI for health, which is indeed cross-disciplinary from computer science, medicine, social sciences, and much more. Uh, with that, I'd like to quickly introduce our amazing speaker today. It's Dr. Nuria Oliver from Ellis. So Dr. Nuria is a Chief Data Scientist at Data Pop Alliance, Chief Scientific Advisor at the Vodafone Institute, and co-founder of Ellis and co-founder of the Atla Alicanta LS unit devoted to research on human-centric artificial intelligence. She's a telecommunication engineer from UPM and holds a PhD in AI from MIT. Since 2020 March, she was named Commissioner of the President of the Valencia Region on AI strategy and data science to fight COVID-19. Since then, she has led a team of approximately 20 data scientists and co-leads the winning team of XPRIZE Pandemic Response Challenge. Uh, it's great to have you here and uh, thanks a lot for agreeing to speak with us. Thank you. A uh, pleasure to be here. So thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, in my presentation, I thought it could be interesting to share the work that we have been doing in the Valencian region of Spain, which is located on the east of Spain by the Mediterranean Sea, south of Catalonia, um, regarding the use of data and AI in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Basically, the focus of our team is to assist policymakers in better decision making through the analysis of data using uh, machine learning methods. And uh, we are a multidisciplinary, multi-institutional team of volunteers from uh, the main universities and research centers in the region, um, working directly with the president of the government of the region. Spain has a federal government model similar to the US. So instead of states, we have what is called autonomous uh, regions or uh, a autonomous communities. And each of them has a president, which is the equivalent to the governor in the US. And um, the presidents uh, have a lot of uh, uh, decision power because a lot of the functions are um, uh, decentralized and delegated to the uh, governments of the regions. In particular, the purpose for our team is to close the gap that there is between where the data is and where the decision makers and the policy makers are. If we want the policies to be informed by evidence, then we need to fill this gap, assuming that the data is a digital representation of an underlying reality. So the focus for our team has been to fill that gap. And to do that, we have a structural work in four different areas. The first one is modeling human mobility because of course, an infectious disease that is transmitted from human to human, like COVID-19 doesn't become a pandemic if people don't move. So modeling human mobility is very important. The second work stream is on building computational epidemiological models, models that will predict the number of COVID-19 cases under different scenarios and into the future. The third area um, is about building predictive models of hospital occupancy fundamentally, and also inferring the prevalence of the disease. Of course, a lot of the policies are driven by a need to avoid the collapse of the medical system. And therefore it's very important to have good models uh, that would predict the hospital and the intensive care occupancy. And the last um, uh, big area is an area that we call citizen science where we launched in March of 2020, a large scale citizen survey called the COVID-19 impact survey, which has over 720,000 answers so far, and has enabled us and policymakers and the media and scientists have a better understanding of the impact of the pandemic on people's lives. Even um, with all these work streams, there is still a gap between the output of this work and where the policymakers are, because this is a still pretty uh, technical work. 
And I think one of the key elements of success for our team and one of my main messages today is actually this layer here of results interpretation and aggregation and preparation and translation from technical results to actionable insights. And this layer has been fundamentally done by a director general working in the presidency of the region in collaboration with me and other team members. And she has been, and she is a member of the team. So a fundamental component for the success of initiatives like this one is having the actual politicians, the actual decision makers be active members of the team because they are the ones that need to understand the work to be able to leverage it and use it. So I think that has been very um, unique in our team. And I think one of the keys to our success. In terms of the technical skills, everyone is a scientist at different levels, from undergraduate to full professors. And depending on the area, there were different areas of expertise. So the mobile data team has a lot of expertise on data visualization, data, data wrangling, um, sort of like GIS data, um, analysis. The epidemiological team has a lot of background on machine learning, but also on computational modeling in general. The predictive models team is mainly uh, machine learning, and then the citizen science team also has a component in human-computer interaction. We have been working very intensely for many months. We have been meeting every day in a meeting that I organize every day, and um, you know we had a GitHub to share all the code and a very active Slack channel where we had all the communication. This is an example of one of our meetings. I had never worked with any of these scientists before and they hadn't worked among themselves, many of them. We had never seen each other in person for many, many, for over a year. We saw each other every day, sometimes multiple times a day, but we actually never saw each other in the flesh until I think it was June of uh, 2021. So uh, many, many months later. We have an official website, unfortunately, it's in Spanish and in, in Valencian um, uh, within the, the government's uh, website. Um, it is actually not easy to create this team. And I think that has been one of the missed opportunities during the pandemic. And there are many reasons why it's not easy. One of the main reasons is that there is a lack of capacity and awareness and a lack of a digital mindset in most of the governments and, and, digital and public administrations. There are also challenges around accessing the data. Many times the data is siloed, is in different uh, types of databases, is not shared across ministries, for example, when in reality you have an underlying reality, you know, that is diverse and multi sort of like uh, disciplinary. There are obvious concerns about privacy and security and data protection, but I wanted to mention that everything we've done has been using completely anonymized, aggregated, non-personal data. So you can still do a lot of interesting things even with uh, uh, aggregated, non-personal, anonymized data. There is also a gap between where research ends and where the real world starts. And I think that's why having this interface and having members in the team that are able to um, uh, uh, close this gap is very important. And then of course, in the context of a pandemic, when you have to make decisions every day, sometimes, you know, many times a day, if you don't have all the, all the elements in place, it's almost impossible to leverage this when you are actually making the decisions. So now I'll go quickly over some of the um, uh, results and the type of uh, uh, projects that we have done. Starting with the mobile data analysis. So this was very important uh, in the spring of 2020 when the pandemic was starting and countries, particularly Spain was the worst country in the world together with Italy in terms of the number of cases, the governments have to implement lockdowns and they needed to understand if those lockdowns were actually working. And, you know, because it was a very severe measure unprecedented in our history. And actually, I think Spain applied one of the most severe lockdowns like in the world where for many weeks, citizens couldn't go even to the street only to buy food or to go to the pharmacy and children were not allowed to leave their homes. To be able to answer these questions, we were appointed the pilot uh, region by Vice President Calvino to be able to analyze large scale um, uh, anonymized data that was uh, captured by the mobile network infrastructure of the three largest telcos in Spain and that was shared with us uh, by the uh, um, Spanish uh, National Office of Statistics. And this is an example of the visualization of the data for the region. This is the, the biggest city in the region, Valencia, and then there will be Alicante and then Castellón de la Plana. 
So we did multiple analysis to try to help the government understand the impact of the lockdown. The first one was analyzing the success of the stay at home campaign. So to do that, um, the special granularity of the data, of course, it wasn't the home of individuals. It was these regions here that you see on the map. And these regions were defined as follows. The regions had to have at least 5,000 inhabitants in them. So if there were municipalities with less than 5,000 inhabitants, they would be merged into one larger region. For example, this region here probably merges multiple villages that have less than 5,000. If the, if the municipalities had between 5,000 and 70,000, then there will be only one region for the municipality and then larger municipalities will be split in multiple regions. For each of the regions here, what we show is the percentage of the population that never left their home region, the region where they slept during the day for more than two hours uh, during, in this case, uh, March of 2020 um, uh, during the confinement. And we can see um, when we analyze the entire first wave that on average, 88% of the people in working days and 92% of the people during the weekends didn't leave their uh, area of residence uh, because of the lockdown. Here we can see a visualization over time where the, the, the more yellow or the more orange that is on the map, the lower the percentage of population that is stayed in the region, so the larger the mobility. And we can see that at the very beginning of the pandemic, there were, you know, it wasn't so green, there was still a fair amount of mobility going on. And then as the lockdown was implemented, which was the, harsh, the harshest lockdown was between March 30th and uh, April uh, 14th, um, the map is really green, meaning that over around, on average, 90% of the population didn't leave their area of residence. From a public um, uh, healthcare perspective, um, an interesting special granularity is what is called the Department of Health, which is the region that is served by a hospital. In the Valencian region of Spain, there are 24 departments of health. And here it shows the percentage of the population that is stayed in their area of residence per Department of Health, both on weekends, which is the brown, the sort of like khaki color, and then uh, during the week, which is this reddish uh, color. And we can see that in all of them, it was above 80% of the population. We also analyzed the impact of the lockdowns on labor mobility, so the mobility that was taking place during working hours, and we found that on average there were 60% less people outside of their area of residence during working hours than when compared to um, a baseline period in November of 2019, before the pandemic. This uh, impact of the labor mobility, again, was very evident during the severe lockdown that took place uh, in April of 2020. This is um, a visualization of the activity levels, which is the combination of the incoming and outgoing flows in each of these regions. The greener the color, the larger the reduction in activity levels when compared to a baseline period in November of 2019. And we can see that at the very beginning of the pandemic, there was certain regions that had a lot of activity, like these ones here in orange and red, and others that you know had already reduced their activity a lot. During the lockdown, the entire map became green, and there was a very severe reduction in the activity levels everywhere. The same thing was observed for each of the departments of health. These are the, the departments of health, the different regions that are covered by each of the departments of health. And what we see on the graph is in orange, the activity levels before the pandemic, and in yellow, the activity uh, levels during the first wave of the pandemic. And we can see that there was a very significant reduction everywhere. We built a visualization system of all these um, activity uh, variables. So the government officials could use them, use this visualization and click on any municipality and understand the impact of the, of the, the lockdown uh, on the mobility of the population. We also um, run a community detection algorithm on the mobility matrices to, under, to identify what we call mobility communities, which are um, uh, geographic regions that are, are self-contained in terms of their mobility, but don't have a lot of mobility with other regions. This was interesting uh, in the case the government wanted to apply partial confinements to really understand the impact of a partial confinement on a particular region. And we identified 14 community uh, mobility community regions, which we call macro health zones, and that will, they will fairly self-contain internally in terms of their mobility. 
The second large area has been developing computational epidemiological models, models that would enable us to predict the number of cases in the future under different scenarios. We have developed three types of models. The first one is a traditional um, a compartmental metapopulation model, a SAIR model, which I assume you're familiar with, that divides the population into four states, susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered. And then the transition between each of the states is given by certain probabilities, which depend on the characteristics of the virus. So for uh, SARS-CoV-2, for coronavirus, these parameters have been estimated and we used uh, the values in the literature to um, uh, define the dynamics of the system. We uh, um, enhanced the traditional SAIR metapopulation model with the mobility information that we had to take into account the impact of the mobility uh, lockdowns. This is an example of the different predictions that we have been running every day using this model. We also developed an agent-based um, epidemiological model. In this case, instead of modeling a metapopulation, the model um, actually built, um, the, the, this model models uh, the, each of the individuals living in the Valencian region of Spain. So it has 5 million agents, and then these agents can move around and they can have, it has an underlying SAIR model, so they can be in four different states, but uh, at an individual level. We have um, developed and fine-tuned uh, an agent-based model for the Valencian region of Spain, and we have also been running predictions using that model. And finally, we developed our last model in the context of the XPRIZE pandemic response challenge, because as part of this challenge, uh, one of the main tasks was to develop a uh, model that would predict the number of COVID-19 infections in 236 regions and countries in the world up to 180 days into the future and taking into account all the different non-pharmaceutical interventions that were implemented in each of these countries and regions. So for the challenge, we developed a deep learning based um, approach where we had two uh, banks of um, LSTMs, which is a type of recurrent neural network. The top one was modeling the number of cases and the bottom one was modeling the impact of the non-pharmaceutical interventions. So the different measures implemented in the different countries and regions. And then we were combining uh, the outputs in this uh, Lambda layer. Our predictor turned out to work pretty well during the competition. So I think we were the third in the mean run globally and we um, were the first in the European countries and in the Asian countries. But I think the most important um, 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 element of this model is that we were able to use it uh, since the third wave of coronavirus in the Valencian region of Spain. The third wave was the worst wave in the Valencian region prior to the sixth wave, which is the one that just ended. And it really put the healthcare system under a lot of strain. It took place right after Christmas of 2020. So using our model, which we finished on December 22nd of 2020, we actually predicted really well the third wave and the government trusted our model. Sometimes I thought maybe too much because it was still a model, but they did put a, a fair amount of faith in the model and it actually fortunately worked pretty well and it held them you know, in their decisions. But more interestingly, just now, we just finished the Omicron wave where we had a lot more cases actually than in the previous waves, but of course, because we have above 93, 95% of the population vaccinated, it didn't have a huge impact on the healthcare system, but still our model, which is shown in red, very accurately predicted the, the third wave of, uh, the sixth wave of Omicron. So we are really happy about that. Uh, uh, and and um, the government um, relied in a, cer a certain extent in our predictions in terms of planning for uh, the end of the sixth wave. Within the express competition, we added a new layer to our basic architecture, which is this uh, pink layer. So the final phase of the express competition required um, teams to what I, create what I call an artificial politician. So to create an AI system that would actually recommend non-pharmaceutical interventions for any of this, for any country in the world and given a certain pandemic situation in the country and also given a certain cost of implementing the interventions. So we um, developed uh, different methods to uh, come up 
with what is called the Pareto optimal set of interventions for each country and region in the world. And that would be the set of interventions that will have the best trade-off between their economic and social cost and the number of cases that you would get if you were to apply such an intervention. We also developed some um, uh, interfaces. So the policymakers could click on a country, could see the different policies that they could apply, and then see the cost uh, of the policies and so forth. Both the predictor in the number of cases and the prescriptor of interventions are presented in this paper that we um, uh, 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 submitted uh, to ECML PKDD and actually we won Best Paper Award also at ECML PKDD. And I didn't mention, but we were also the winners of the Pandemic uh, Response Challenge by XPRIZE. Um, other work that we have done with the computational epidemiological models has been analyzing the impact of contact tracing to be able to tell the government what percentage of the population would be like um, the minimum that they should contact trace to flatten the curve. And also adding, of course, vaccination into the models, both the agent-based model and the deep learning-based uh, model. And the results that I showed for the sixth wave of infections, the Omicron wave that we call it in Spain, that model includes, of course, vaccination. The third area of work has been on building predictive models of hospital occupancy and intensive care occupancy. And to do that, we have also used uh, deep learning based methods. And especially during the third wave, we were doing daily predictions on the occupancy of the hospitals and the intensive care units. And the last um, um, activity has been a very large scale uh, citizen survey called the COVID-19 impact survey. We launched this survey in March of 2020 because we realized that we didn't have any relevant data related to very important questions that we wanted to answer in terms of the pandemic. For example, what is the social contact behavior of people? What is the economic and the labor impact? What is the resilience of the population in, in, with respect to the lockdown measures? What is the prevalence of symptoms? You know, there was the, at, the, at a certain time, there wasn't even tests. What's the emotional impact of the pandemic? Which individual protection measures do people adopt? Is contact tracing working or is not working? I mean, there were so many questions and such little data in a sense. So we decided to launch this survey. It is fully anonymous. It has, uh, originally it had 30, uh, 26 questions right now. I think it has 31 because we've added some questions about social isolation, which are very important um, now in the last phase of the pandemic. I encourage you to answer the survey. Ideally, you answer every week because of course your situation changes and also the pandemic situation changes. The survey has now over 720,000 answers, mostly from Spain, Germany, Italy, and Brazil. The survey became vital when we launched it and we obtained over 140,000 answers in 40 hours. It was actually collapsing the servers. And we felt so uh, um, grateful and emotional by such a strong response by the population. We had you know, town halls sharing the survey, universities, civic associations, random people. Uh, WhatsApp was like you know, flooded with the survey. So there was such a strong response that we felt we had to share the data and the results of the analysis of the data really quickly. So I remember that we didn't sleep for a few nights analyzing the data and we very quickly wrote this paper that we made it publicly available with the main insights of uh, the analysis of our data. Most of the insights that we found in April of 2020 still apply today. So um, uh, we've been repeating a lot of our insights throughout the pandemic. For example, the impact of the pandemic in the youth, the differential impact of gender, the difficulties to self-isolate, um, the economic impact. I mean, there's been a lot of results that are the same. This is obsolete, it's more than 700,000 now. Um, we developed two different visualizations, but the one that you, we keep updated is the one on the right, which is done in Tableau, and we update it every week with the latest results. We have published several papers uh, um, on, on, uh, on some of the uh, results from this survey. It's a very multi-dimensional survey, so we can do a lot of different analysis on it. So I encourage you to take a look if you are interested. This one on the left is the, the more recent one. It was published just a, a few weeks ago, and it analyzes the impact of what is called the TTI strategy, the 
the test trace isolated strategy in actually controlling uh, the progression of the virus, we find that it was not successful. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been waves. And we analyzed you know, which one of the pillars wasn't very successful and why. And what are some of the results of the survey? So a very consistent result for almost two years now is the emotional impact of the pandemic. We find consistently that the most impacted group is the youth. And within the youth, the most impacted are women, where over half of the young women report having stress levels that they consider detrimental to their health or anxiety levels that they consider detrimental to their health. But even loneliness um, is actually the most accentuated amongst the youth. So for many, many months, we've been um, making this public and suggesting that governments should approve some kind of public policies to support the emotional health and the mental health of the youth, because since the very first day, this was one of the results. We also have feedback on the perception of the government measures, and the perception actually is quite aligned with the waves of the pandemic. Here it shows for Spain, and the colors mean in yellow is the people that think that the, the government should do more. In green is the people that think that the government is doing enough. And in red is the people that think that is doing too much. So as you see, with the different waves, people demand doing too much, This is doing more. This is the last wave that just happened, the Omicron wave. And then as the wave goes down, then the demand for measures also goes down. Um, so it's very, very aligned. Actually, it's a little bit before the measure. So it's a good predictor of like what, uh, what is going on in terms of the waves. We also have information about which individual protection measures people adopt, if people wear masks, if they disinfect hands, you know, if they avoid uh, crowds, if they ventilate. And here, the main findings throughout the pandemic are, the first one, women are a lot more compliant than men. This has always been like this for the entire pandemic. Women are way, very significantly more compliant. The second result is ventilation is the least adopted measure, even though we know that is one of the most important. So we've also been recommending week after week that more outreach campaigns and communication campaigns should focus on ventilation. We know that it's absolutely fundamental to prevent infection, and yet it's like one of the measures that is the least uh, deployed. And then, and this is lucky in Spain, we have very, very uh, high willingness to get vaccinated. This actually is low now because Spain has over 95% of the population vaccinated. So the people uh, that are left, you know, are more reluctant, but um, it has always, we've always had above 90, 93% of intention to get vaccinated. And this is very remarkable because it's not like this everywhere in Europe. If we look at the data from our survey, we see very huge uh, differences between the intention to get vaccinated in Spain versus Germany, for example, where the intention is way, way lower. We also have information about the evolution of the perception of risk of different activities. Um, this is over time since um, uh, May of 2020 until February of 2022. And here the question is, do you think that this particular activity can be performed with low risk of a COVID-19 infection? Some of the more consistent findings, as you see, the activity that is considered the safest is doing individual sports outdoors, which is like, I don't know how you're gonna get COVID if you're doing individual sports outdoors, but still it's not hundred percent of the people that think it's safe. And then the least safe activity, as you see for the entire pandemic is flying by plane, even though there aren't really a lot of registered outbreaks in planes. So here is very interesting to see how important the communication is in terms of the risk you know, of different activities. We find a fair um, correlation between uh, what people do and what people think is safe. And the clearest example is going to the beach, which is marked in red, where we see that in the winter months, people don't think it's very safe, but then as the summer comes, then people start thinking that it's safe to go to the beach. So there is a certain correlation between what people do and you know, the activities that they think they're safe. Yeah. This is another area that has been very consistent throughout the pandemic, which is the ability to self-isolate if needed. Since March of 2020, we know that on average, 50% of the people six, 59 and younger are unable to self-isolate. So we have been proposing measures to uh, and programs to support self-isolation. Otherwise, people are going to continue infecting, even if they are positive, because they cannot self-isolate. Some of the more uh, peculiar findings is the reasons, we ask people the reasons for not being able to self-isolate. 
the most common reason is shedding the home, but there is a very significant difference in psychological reasons depending on the age. The youth is the most likely demographic group to report that they wouldn't be able to self-isolate because of psychological reasons, including fear of stigmatization, which is like 15% among young women. And another interesting gender difference is the inability to self-isolate because of having to take care of others, particularly children or the elderly, where for women in Spain that are in child, sort of like reading age, which is between 30 and I, I guess and 59, is like 28% of the women versus only 13% of the men report that they wouldn't be able to self-isolate because of having to take care of others. So we see a very clear differential impact of the pandemic on women versus men when it comes to taking care of children. And finally, we have data about the contact tracing app. And we can say that it hasn't really worked, neither in Spain nor in Italy nor in Germany. This is just some data from Spain. So from 100, over 139 answers, roughly a third, a little bit less than a third report having the app installed. So that's very high adoption, actually. It's not bad. Of those, only 7.7% uh, report that they had a positive contact, a contact with a positive case. So a third of them should have somehow received a notification. However, only 86 out of these 3,200 people report that they discover that they were infected with the app. So there's a huge drop in like, you know, the discovery. And then there's another huge drop in terms of how many got tested, where only 27 got tested, and then only seven people tested positive. So out of an original pool of 139,000 people, seven uh, were discovered thanks to the app. And then, as I mentioned, um, one of our focus uh, now is understanding the impact of the pandemic and the measures on social isolation, which is an extremely important public health issue. And we just finished this paper, where, which I think is like the largest paper on analyzing social, the, the paper that analyzes the largest sample um, of social isolation with over 32,000 answers. And we find that the most socially isolated groups is actually the middle-aged people. Uh, where the prevalence is actually around 30%, which is very, very, very high, extremely high, like probably twice or more than twice than before the pandemic. We find a very clear relationship between social isolation and severe economic impact. Here you can see the people that had a positive economic impact from the pandemic actually um, have a, lo a lower prevalence of um, uh, social isolation than the ones that were not affected. So there is a, a very clear correlation, but then the people that were severely affected had roughly twice the probability, like twice the levels of social isolation when compared to the ones that have positive impact. There is also a relationship with psychological impact, but it's less intense than with uh, economic impact. And then we find interesting relationships between the behaviors and the perceptions and the prevalence of social isolation. So the more um, COVID pr uh, protection measures you adopt, the more isolated you are. I guess it makes sense because the measures are meant to isolate you, but we do see very clearly in the data that the people that do not take any measures are the least socially isolated. And then something similar happens with the perception of risk. The, the people that consider that only you, should, you shouldn't do any activity or you should only do essential activities because of the risk of getting a COVID, they have a huge prevalence of social isolation, which is like over 40%, when compared to people that they think that you could do many, many more activities with low risk. So what have we learned after all this work? So I think one of the most um, basic learnings is that a pandemic is not a public health issue, it's a societal issue and requires multidisciplinary holistic approaches. We've also learned that we need to develop a virtuous cycle between these three elements that I don't think we haven't yet. On the one hand, data that is high quality, that is systematically captured and updated and shared and analyzed so we can understand where we are, why we are where we are, but also kind of predict where we might be going. The second pillar is actually investing in the right human resources and technology that these human resources can use to actually uh, you know, be able to be efficient on their work. And this means not only having you know, enough healthcare and social workers and researchers and contact tracers you know, and, and, and teachers and so forth, but also the right technology for these people to be able to use it. And of course, 
you want to do all this because you want to design better policies and you want to understand the impact of your policies. So you have to close the loop and, and be willing to um, accept what the data might be telling you, even if you, know, you might not agree with it from a sort of like political perspective. So there is another dimension beyond the technical dimension, which is more of like a human you know, a dimension and a political dimension. Reflecting on all these topics, I co-wrote this paper with Data Pop Alliance and the Vodafone Institute on sort of like what we think would be needed to leverage data and technology in the context of pandemics, not only for COVID-19, but moving into the future. And we also have a lot of publications that are publicly available if you want to know more about our work. So with this, I just stopped for questions. And I would just finish saying that in the Ellis uh, uh, unit Alicante Foundation, which is called the Institute of Humanity-Centric AI. We have a lot of openings right now uh, for all sorts of researcher positions. So maybe if one of you is interested in, in our work, you can look at our website and apply for a position. Thank you. That's, that's awesome. That was an entire, that, that's a lot of information out there. Thanks a lot for sharing this great work with us. Uh, so. I guess I'll start with like a couple of questions that I had in mind and then uh, Graham and others can also uh, have it. So one question I had is like you mentioned, you use both the agent based model and deep learning based models. And, and we've seen, we've seen that the, uh, the behavior of the virus was different across different waves. So which of these models were more robust to these changes or which of them were easier to adapt to these changes? So the most flexible one is the deep learning based model because um, um, it, it just continues learning from the current data and is proven in our experience to work really, really well. The other models are more traditional models that require uh, a lot more parameters that need to be fine tuned and they are more difficult to um, adapt when you know the virus changes or you know the vaccination you know uh, campaigns start and so forth so i think the more traditional models require a lot more design and a lot more tuning of parameters the deep learning based model is very self uh, maintained you basically continue updating the model with the data and it uh, updates itself and, and continues making predictions so it's, it's very very flexible in that sense um of course, the other models might be perhaps more interpretable, but in this case where, you know, we want to predict the number of cases and um, we do have the layer in the bottom in the deep learning based model that models the intervention. So it's, it's not all mixed up, so we're more difficult to, under, to interpret. So um, we are pretty happy with it. I, it's my favorite model right now. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely makes sense. Uh, and I guess as a quick follow up to that, uh, is that you mentioned about the interpretability component. So uh, I've seen that it's often different things that uh, what we mean when computer scientists tell that this model is interpretable versus a health scientist versus a political uh, public policymaker. So, uh, so were there such challenges and how did you sort of manage that communication on the interpretability of the deep learning yeah. models or in yeah. general? The so it's even beyond the models. I, I think it's in general the interpretability and significance of the results. So to me, I think it's absolutely necessary to have the key stakeholders being real members of the team, uh, members that come to every meeting, that are equally invested, that, um, that really uh, participate. And I think it's very, very important. Um, otherwise, I don't think you develop the trust that is necessary to, to believe you know, and, 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 and use these results, but also you don't develop the, the mutual understanding that is also necessary. So it goes beyond understanding you know, the parameters in, in, a, in a deep neural network. It's just understanding what the results are, why are they important? How can they be actionable? You know, what can you do with them? And as I said, this requires really a pretty, uh, commit, a pretty strong commitment from the decision makers. You know, I mean, this director general, she came to every single meeting every day, you know, having a politician do this is not necessarily common, unfortunately, right? So, um, so that was very, very important. And through the, the frequent interaction for so many months, 
in many of the months in, in situations of a lot of stress. I mean, there was a lot of, a lot. Spain suffered a lot, during, particularly during the first wave and situation was very severe. And it also helps you develop a bond. And I think that bond and that trust in the relationship was the key for our model being used in the third wave uh, after Christmas of 2020, which was the worst wave in this particular region. This particular region had done pretty well throughout the pandemic uh, when compared to other regions of Spain or Europe. So they were really happy. And you know they thought that maybe partly it was because of our work, I don't know. But then the third wave hit and it was really, really bad. And um, if we had just shown up at that point saying, oh, we developed this model, here's the prediction. I don't think anyone had care, but the fact that we had been working for so many months together, that we had been building models you know, constantly, that we had this trust was absolutely necessary. And I think the only way you develop trust is by having you know, very frequent communication and having a mutual understanding. And this, is, this you can only do with interactions. You know? So that's very important for me. If we, I think this is one of the distinctive elements of our team. If we hadn't had that, I don't think our models, even if they won the pandemic response challenge or we won best paper award, or I don't think they might have been uh, used or impactful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Makes sense. Uh, I guess I'll just uh, ask, let Graham ask a couple of questions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Noria. That was very comprehensive. Um, I know you've got a lot in a very short amount of time. Um, which non-pharma interventions were the most effective in Valencia? Yeah, so we have a, we did a, okay, so when we had to do, maybe I can go a little bit into the detail. So when we did the prescriptor of interventions, we had to figure out which interventions what was the impact of the different kinds of interventions on the number of cases? And there were 12 different kinds of interventions. So to do that, we built a machine learning model to predict the reproductive sort of like rate and a model that uh, enabled us to rank the different interventions by their contribution. And we found that labor interventions and education interventions were the most impactful. So, um, um, so we also share that with the government. Um, um, I can't remember all the details of the ranking, but I can look in the paper right now, but we do have a ranking on um, the impact of the interventions um, according to the model on the number of cases. Yeah, uh, let Thank me you. look for the ranking if you want to see it, all the details. Uh, and while you're doing that, we have a question in our Q&A. Um, someone's asking, what is your opinion on the next pandemic? Uh, how would crowdsourcing be an element to the next pandemic identification? And I think yeah, so I, was, so I was telling Rohan earlier before the talk, I think um, post-pandemic, I think there's a fair amount of interest and, and uh, sort of like financing opportunities on early warning detection systems, uh, surveillance detection systems to try to um, sort of like avoid getting <laughs> into the next pandemic. Um, we, um, we did some work in collaboration with the uh, water company here in um, analyzing the residual waters for potential traces of COVID-19 as an early detection system. This has also been used in other parts of the world. So I think there are, mm, there are sort of like different data sources that could be helpful for early detection. Um, in our particular case, um, probably I think some kind, I mean, and, and this was this startup in Canada sort of like claimed, you know, before the pandemic that they saw different patterns, you know, before the pandemic. Um, including reports of this uh, uh, strange new disease, you know, back in like, uh, I think it was November of 2019 or, or December of 2019. So I think for, um, to early detect a new pandemic, I think we, we need to have um, some kind of intelligent, uh, multi-source, multi-data, sort of like multi-model system that is able to um, analyze different data sources and identify 
unusual patterns in these data sources. I think the challenge is, you know, you could have if you don't have a very low false positive rate, you could be thinking that there's a pandemic every month. So it's it's not it's a very difficult problem. I don't think it's an easy problem to um, to solve. We 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 haven't done a lot of work on early warning, uh, so I I don't have a lot of uh, experience. Um, well. Yeah. I, I would I would add to that. I mean, just from my experience looking at flu season data, I know that the crowdsourcing data does help add a, more context to the testing data because often the testing data starts at a seasonal sort of marker, regardless of when the flu season actually started. So there's this sort of bias that ends up occurring based on the fact that the surveillance starts in October here in the U.S. or runs through May. Therefore, all the testing tends to start in October as well, regardless of whether or not there's actually flu cases in August or September. Yeah. So the yeah. crowdsourcing data is what helps inform those earlier, sort of early warning months for that flu season. I wonder how that maybe plays out in a larger context of a global pandemic. Yeah, I mean, we have a, we do have crowdsourcing the survey as well, and we have the in the survey we have a, a question about symptoms that has worked pretty well in terms of um, the correlation between our symptom um, sensor and the waves. So um, it is true, but um, you'll have to see, you know, they had to be deployed some crowdsourcing tool or something uh, because I don't know if mining social media is, um, it has enough signal. I don't know if there is too much noise or, you know, we know what happened with the Google flu trends and the biases that were there. So I think, uh, you know, some uh, precautions need to be taken. But in this particular survey where we have a specific questions on symptoms, um, we have built a prevalence model based on the, on the symptoms and we can see the different waves based on the symptoms. So, um, you know, you can do this with the, but this is an ad, this is an ad hoc survey for you know the pandemic, uh, which is not. I I presume people are not going to be answering this survey forever. So I think for the crowdsourcing, I agree with you. It's a very valuable data source, but I think um, it's not trivial to develop the algorithms that are able to discern you know sort of like the noise from the signal and 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 be sort of like accurate enough. Yeah. And ideally, there are some sort of passive data streams that don't require participation that yeah. can be mined. Yeah, that so exactly. So that's the residual waters is passive. But, you know, by the time you see it in the residual waters, I don't know, people are already having it. So I don't know. Uh, uh, but I guess it's the same with crowdsourcing. And then I have done a fair amount of work on on the passive side in terms of analyzing data from the mobile network infrastructure that is passively captured by the... Um, by the based uh, transmitter stations like the BTS, the cell towers. And this is passively collected data. It's sort of like coarse, large scale aggregated data on mobility patterns, activity patterns. Uh, but you know, if you notice, you know, a lot of people don't go to work anymore, you know, you notice significant changes in mobility, you notice significant changes in the patterns of like calls and things like that, it could be indicative of, you know, something strange happening, you know, in, in the population. Yeah. I have a philosophical question for you in terms of the success of your AI in these models is incredible. Um, and uh, I wonder how you feel about the use of AI for the decision making itself. At what point does the AI make the recommendations? I mean, you already sort of touched on that where it's providing the data, the analysis and the modeling. Then it's sort of it's being used to then recommend decisions, right? And policies. <laughs> To the policymakers. So, at what point are the policymakers just basically sitting back and waiting for the AI to tell them what to do? Well, I mean, this is actually one of the areas that we are working on in the in the Elisa Alicante unit. Um, so, it's a very uh, very important area. So, I guess the first question would be, why would you rely on algorithms? You know, and I think the the motivation is because we know that human decisions are not perfect. We know that we have biases. We know that we get tired, that we get hungry. We know that we have interests. We know that we are susceptible to corruption. We know that we have enemies and friends. You know, So there are so many 
motivations for our decisions, right? That the, the idea is, well, if data is an objective representation of reality, and we build algorithms that analyze and interpret the data, we could have more fair decisions because these algorithms wouldn't be hungry or sleepy, you know, or have friends and enemies, blah, blah, blah. That's the idea. And I think the idea is, is, a, is, a, is a worth aspiration no? to try to improve human decision making. But what we know too is that this is not exactly the case because algorithmic decision making has its own challenges and limitations. Some of them, because the data that we use to train the models is biased because it's just a reflection of a, of a biased reality. So the models learn, not only learn the biases, but sometimes they even exacerbate you know, and amplify those biases. But sometimes uh, the limitations are intrinsic to the models. For example, you know, the lack of transparency, uh, a big part of it is because the models are too complex or the models are, are hackable, are brittle. They are not foolproof. You can actually trick them. And um, this is called adversarial machine learning, right? So you can actually on purpose try to trick the models to your advantage in the same way as I guess you could on purpose try to trick a human you know, to your advantage. So I think um, there is a potential, but my personal view is more of a view of um, humanity augmentation more than replacement. I think that if we are able to create tools that help us make better decisions, um, we will be doing you know, something positive for society, um, but not necessarily um, replacing humans in the decisions, but, but more augmenting us you know, in our own decision-making. And, and that's sort of like the direction that we are going um, to. Um, um, still, um, the amount of hidden, invisible algorithmic decision-making that is going on in our daily lives is incredible. I mean, every single service that we use, you know, on, on our on our smartphones, you know, has a, is full of machine learning that is like, you know, automating, you know, a lot of things and selecting content for us and recommending content for us and trying to influence, you know, our decisions and our actions and our thoughts and in a very non-transparent way. So it is already there. It is already happening. Um, of course, it's not the same thing, maybe, that is trying to influence me in like seeing some friends update or some other friends update or some piece of news versus deciding whether I go to jail or not, or whether, you know, I get a visa or not, or whether I'm accepted in a certain, you know, university or not, or I'm giving credit, you know, or I'm giving healthcare. Those are very consequential decisions where, you know, it's even more important to make sure that these limitations, you know, are taken care of. But the reality is that we are coexisting already with with highly non-transparent, sort of like invisible, you know, algorithms that are already influencing, you know, uh, our decisions. And that's one also one of the lines of work that we have really revealing the degree to which, you know, all these algorithms are influencing us and trying to advocate for more transparency and also more control, you know, on, on people's um, hands. Because I think at the end of the day, uh, at least in Western ethics, human Autonomy is one of the fundamental values, you know, human autonomy basically is sort of like the, the, the power, you know, that people have to make their own decisions and to, uh, uh, to take their own actions. Yeah. Yeah. And at some point, I'm sure the insurance companies will determine where the liability should lie, whether or not that influences the data scientists creating the algorithm and the pressure that they're under versus the decision makers at the top, you know, with the, being informed by those data. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, fascinating, it's, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, it is, it is, it is. But at the same time, you know, I mean, I think at the end of the day, there should be a human in the loop, um, mm -hmm. um, because otherwise it's just really, first of all, it's really given too much power to algorithms on people's lives, you know, and it's also makes it very complicated also from a, from a legal perspective in terms of liability and so forth, because right. these are very complex systems that are being developed by different people, prob probably different companies, you know, that play different roles. Um, um, I mean, here in Europe, we have the proposal of a regulation of AI, and, you know, it's extremely um, complex because what is an AI system? 
does an AI system need to have 100% AI? What kind of AI? You know, how, right. what happens if they have some, you know, it doesn't have to be AI. You can have does an algorithm that says, yeah, everyone that is called Graham, I'm not going to give him credit. <laughs> That's my algorithm, right? It's discriminating a lot. It's not using AI, but still, you know, and you could use that to give credit. It's like, I give credit to everyone except for everyone called Graham because I don't like that name, whatever. I mean, so yeah. it doesn't have to be an AI algorithm, right? It, it, it's just basically automating human decisions, you know, in machines that um, that matters. Um, because otherwise well, I know what's gonna happen. People are gonna be like, oh, but my algorithm is not AI. So it's not subject to the regulation. Right. <laughs> this is the importance of the, of the different variables according to the model. So workplace closing was by far the most impactful according to our model. Um, with like almost twice the impact and the second one, which was education. So school means education, including universities and so mm. forth. Fascinating. And then the testing policy was actually quite important according to the model. According well, to the model, canceling public events wasn't very important <laughs> or masks wasn't very important according to the model. <laughs> yeah, compared which, to yeah, the Yeah, no, ones. and that's the yeah. political, you know, implications there of that, you know, information are yeah. pretty profound too. Well, Noria, thank you very much for your thorough presentation. Um, Rohan, do we have any more questions before we wrap up? Uh, no, I guess uh, it's, it's good. And we definitely like to touch base again because uh, all the aspects that you mentioned, starting from social messaging and uh, the various predictive modeling efforts is definitely interesting for Patrick. And I'm sure that Patrick, LS and Valencia can do a lot of things together as well. So uh, we'll definitely be awesome. in touch on more of this. Yes, so of course. Again, yeah. Again, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. If you guys see ways for us to collaborate, we'd, we'd, we'd love to figure out, you know, how to collaborate. And uh, I'd be happy to host you here in Spain if you want to visit us also. Uh, so, yeah, thank well, you very much for the opportunity. I, I think what you've what you've done is the gold standard this at this point. So I think all wow. regions should model what, what they do from now on after what you've done in Valencia. Oh Thank my you God. very much. <laughs> I think that's a big, a big statement. <laughs> but well, if it's been helpful, I'm happy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.